Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you choose to watch this video. I'm Chris Weber, the pastor at St. Peter's Lutheran Church here in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I pray that this video finds you well wherever you are today. Today we're going to be uh, taking a look at a parable of Jesus from Matthew chapter 20. But before we do that, if you haven't already done so, to find a spot to sit wherever it is you are. If you're doing something, stop whatever it is you're doing, and I invite you again, take a nice deep breath with me as we remember who we are in Christ as his baptized people. We are those who've been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Listen, listen, God is calling through the Jesus gave his mandate, share the good news, that he came to save us and set us free. Listen, listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort and joy. Listen, listen, God is calling through the be forgotten throughout the world in the triune name of God go and baptize listen listen God is calling through the word inviting offering forgiveness comfort and joy listen listen God is to be faithful standing steadfast walking in your precepts led by your word listen listen god is calling through the word inviting offering forgiveness comfort and joy listen listen A reading from Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? 
They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. Here ends the reading. My one-year-old during his nap time has the new hobby of jumping up and down, dancing and singing throughout his nap time. And sometimes when he's jumping up and down or dancing and singing, he may bump his hand or his knee and start saying, Owie which I can hear him doing right now. I, I say that just so that if you hear some sounds coming from the background of my one-year-old, consider it just him saying hello to all of you today. To all of you children that are out there listening today, God does not play favorites with his people. He doesn't get all of his disciples and followers together and then organize them by, well, you're you're really my favorite, and you're kind of my favorite, and you're a little bit less than my favorite. No, he treats us all equally through his love. And one of the greatest reminders we have of that equal gift of love that God gives to us as his people is baptism. When we are baptism, baptized, we are all given the same Holy Spirit. When we are baptized, we are all treated by God as equals equals as his sons and daughters together. None of us is more important than the other, but God loves us equally as his own. This is what God's grace does for us, right? He gives us all the same blessings in Christ, the same forgiveness, the same life, uh, promise of eternal life, the same gift of salvation. And this is good for us because it reminds us that if we're looking at another follower of Jesus and thinking, you know what, I think they're better than me. We have God reminding us to say, no, you're equal in my love. And if we ever have the tendency to look at another Christian person and say, you know what, I don't think you're as good as I am. God reminds us to say, no, they were baptized too. They have the Holy Spirit. They are living in the gift of my grace and they are equals with you as well. And when we look at each other as being equals, equally loved by God, it makes it so much easier to love one another and to live in the wonderful gift of love that God has given to us. For the rest of you out there listening today, competition is a huge formative part of our society today. And competition touches on so many different aspects of our lives. Economics are frequently discussed in terms of competition, like competition drives businesses to adapt and to innovate, right? If another business is doing better than yours, then you can compare yourselves with other businesses and see what you can do to improve and make sure that you survive as a business. And not only to survive, but then to thrive and create more value in the work that you're doing as a business, right? Competition. But this isn't just about economics and business. This touches on our lives socially as well. Consider social media, likes and followers. It is so easy to start to compare ourselves with likes and followers. Oh, I've got 20 likes and that person's got a thousand. Well, that person's only got five. 
Or I've got a hundred friends and, well, that person's got a million friends and followers and, well, that person's got 40. And we try to find our place in there in, as far as where we are in the scheme of that comparison and that competition. And we compare ourselves and then therefore try to put out posts and things that get the most likes. But this isn't just about social media either. The things we wear, the cars we drive, the things we furnish our homes with, the accomplishments we have in plaques and cases upon our walls and in our houses. I imagine that many of us have had a moment in our life where we're standing in somebody else's house, looking around thinking either, I'm glad I'm not like them, or what do I need to do to get to be more like this person who seems to be so ahead of me? And we listen to them and compare and try to find a way to get ahead. This isn't just true of social engagements. It's true of the church as well. Denominations compare themselves with other denominations and compete. Knowingly or unknowingly, they try to be the best denomination. Congregations do this as a whole as well. And even us as individual Christians, we compare ourselves with foreign missionaries, with pastors, or with new people to the faith who may not be as strong in their prayer life, or may be different socially as far as we go, and we compare ourselves and we try to figure out where do we stack up, and what do we need to do to make sure we stay where we are or we move ahead in that competition. This tendency towards competing, it does something to us. Many people refer to it, again, as a, a positive thing. It motivates us to do better, to be better. But often that motivation can come out of a place of fear. Consider in the grand scheme of competing, if you're on the bottom, there's a sense of wondering, what am I really worth? If I'm not ahead of anybody else, if I'm not really offering anything of value, am I of any value? Am I of any worth if there's so many people that are ahead of me that are better than I am? If you're in the middle with all the people jostling for position, right, there's this discontentment that comes, this anxious toil to try to make sure you're getting ahead of the person that just maybe passed you or, or making sure you're not dropping behind because value is attributed to where you are in that scheme of things. What you accomplish, what you put forward becomes a reality of our worth. And if you are on top, right, or near the top, we think, well, that's the place where there's no more anxious toil, but that's not true. There is this anxiety even being at the top, this fear that if I step down a place or move down in the competition, then suddenly my value is diminished. Throughout the whole thing, what competition does is it urges us to place value upon people to judge what our worth is compared with other people. And there's a sense of fairness to this, right? If you work hard, if you accomplish a lot, then you deserve to have the position or place that you have. And this, again, this idea of competition, it's not just one thing. It's not just finances. It's not just business. It's the way we view our education, the schools we go to. It views our, changes our views of our relationships as individuals, how we view ourselves as a church, how we are as individual Christians. So much is shaped by competition. Jesus tells a parable. The master of a house goes out very early in the morning, probably before sunrise, to get workers to go and work in his vineyard for the day. And he finds a group of workers and he agrees to pay them a denarius for a day's work. And they go out and they start working in the vineyard. Later on, the master of the house wants more workers. There's more work to be done. And so he goes out later on in the morning and gets more workers. He says, I'll pay you what is fair. He does the same thing at noon and then later on in the later afternoon and then in the early evening. And finally, it gets to be the end of the day. There's like one hour left in the workday. But the master of the house wants more workers to help in his vineyard. And so he goes out and there's people that have been standing around doing nothing. They haven't been working all day because nobody asked them to. He tells you, go and work in my vineyard as well. They go and they work the last hour of the day. And then at times, 
uh, and, and then the, the work day is over and, and the master has everybody line up to receive their pay and he, he starts paying those that worked that one last hour of the evening first and he gives them a denarius. And then he has those that worked starting in the afternoon and he gives them a denarius and those that started in the morning he gives them a denarius and then those that started early in the morning he gives them the exact same pay a denarius. This isn't fair. Can you imagine right, working a 12-hour shift, busting yourself all day to do your work that you've been asked to do, and the boss hires somebody else to, have to work the last hour of the day alongside of you with the work that you're doing, and then when you get paid, you get the very same pay. Not the same hourly rate, the same total pay, right? You work 12 hour a day, you get $120, and then the person that worked the last hour of the day also gets $120. The laborers in this vineyard, these ones that started early in the morning, they're frustrated by this. And they actually complain to the master. They say, this isn't right. You're treating us as equals. We're not equals. We worked the whole heat of the day from sunup till sundown, and these people only worked one little bit at the end of the day. This isn't fair. This isn't just. But this is grace. God chooses in his grace in Jesus Christ to give out of his generosity equally to all of his people. Every single disciple, every disciple has the same amount of forgiveness. Every follower of Jesus gets the same pay at the end of the day, the promise of eternal life. Every single follower of Jesus gets the same promise that at Christ's return, there will be a hundredfold blessing poured into our lap. Every single follower of Jesus gets the same Holy Spirit. By grace, God treats us all as equals in Jesus. When we think about grace, we often think of something that's comforting. And grace, no doubt, is extremely comforting. But grace can also be maddening and infuriating, especially when we approach it from a worldview of competition. Competition keeps our eyes anxiously watching other people, anxiously trying to figure out what is their value and worth and what is mine and what do I need to one-up the next person to be able to get ahead. That's what competition does to us, right? And so when we're looking at people as far as being Christians goes, right, we consider people like Peter, James, and John, Moses, and Elijah, right, really important and valuable people as far as disciples goes. We look at foreign missionaries and sometimes pastors and things, they're a more valuable disciple than I am. And then we may look at maybe new converts to the faith, people who aren't very strong in their faith, or maybe people who aren't very strong in their prayer or devotion life, people who may not be as educated or maybe uh, more poor or, or maybe socially think and dress differently than we do. And yet they're Christians, but we kind of look down on them knowingly or unknowingly at times, right? That's what competition does to us. It teaches us to compare others. And it can be infuriating when we're trying to figure out our sense of value over against others to encounter God's grace, which says, you're all equals. And you're all getting the same forgiveness. And you're all getting the very same gift of eternal life and the same blessing into eternity, the blessing of a hundredfold poured into our laps. What this does to us, right? I mean, consider that. Peter, James, John, you and me and all other disciples that we may think are more important than us or we may have the twisted tendency also to see them as less than us. Every single one of us is going to get the exact same thing when Christ comes back. Eternal life. We all share in the gift of forgiveness now equally. That's what it's like when God reigns, right? His grace is given out equally to us all because we are all equally his laborers in his vineyard. 
And this isn't just about some future day. The reign of God has begun already in Jesus Christ, which means we're supposed to continually view our fellow disciples as equals now, today. And that changes us because God's grace, God's grace cuts through the fear of competition. I mean, consider if you're on the bottom, right? And you're wondering, what in the world am I worth? Do I have any value at all as a person because I haven't accomplished much? I haven't gotten ahead of anybody else. And suddenly, Christ comes along and drops salvation in your lap. Drops the gift of eternal life and forgiveness. Drops his valuing of us upon us. There's such joy there, right? Such comfort. If you're in the middle jostling for position, trying to make sure you're always one step ahead of somebody else and not falling too far behind others who may be advancing in whatever the competition is, there is discontentment there. But grace is the place that contentment begins. And it pulls us out of that constant clamoring for position and just says, you have this value in Christ, salvation, eternal life, and his forgiveness. If we're near the top and we feel like what we have, we have worked hard for it and we deserve it over and above others and we look down upon others as being less valuable than us as we do this competition thing, grace may hurt a bit because we may find that grace is going to knock us down from the high place we think that we have and to see ourselves as equals with others. In the whole scheme of things, whether top, middle, or bottom, All of this places value upon what people accomplish and do. And grace is a whole different way of valuing people. It is looking at what God has done in Christ and saying he values us all equally, completely and utterly and sometimes maddeningly equally. Grace cuts through the fear of competition and cuts through that fear and anxious toil that comes from comparing ourselves with others. Now, I do want to be somewhat clear about this as best as I can. We are all equals as disciples, but we are different, meaning we have unique gifts that God gives. We have unique roles that we are called into, and every single one of us has a unique position in life as a worker who follows Christ. Every single one of us. This goes along with what Paul says about the church being the body of Christ, right? The I can't say to the foot, I don't need you. We're all equals as far as laborers in the vineyard. And any differences we may have as far as experiences or the way that we are created or our abilities or uniqueness in our roles, any of those things are never ever meant for comparison as if one is more valuable than the other. Right? If we start doing that, we just end up comparing and then competing. And when we compete, we will either harm ourselves or harm others because we will devalue someone in the midst of trying to get ahead in the whole scheme of competing. We are all equals. <coughs> Excuse me. Equals by God's grace. Though we have unique gifts and roles, all utterly and completely unique, or excuse me, equal by his grace. And this changes us, right? It puts us in a position, if we look at each other as equals, suddenly we can walk together. We can rejoice together. We can grieve together. We can empathize with one another and we can work together Because that's exactly what we have been called to do, to work together, to labor together in God's kingdom on this earth as equals. This is just, right? Sometimes because of that tendency to look at the world through eyes of competition, it seems so utterly unfair. But this is just. God gives his grace in Christ equally to us all. And invites us to keep our eyes focused on him. When we start focusing on others, there's the tendency to compare. We keep our eyes focused on Christ, his gift to us, the gift that we all equally receive. And we keep striving to walk in that equality, 
equally sharing in the wonderful work he has called us to as laborers in his kingdom. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, some days it is so hard to find value in you. There are so many different things that compete for our value today. Sometimes we look at others and we, we value accomplish its accomplishments differently, or we value education or finances or, or whatever achievements there may be. <clears throat> Keep us away from this dangerous mentality that attaches worth to people and to ourselves based upon what we have done. It doesn't mean that the work that we do does not matter, our uniqueness doesn't matter. But teach us to attribute value based upon your grace and to see each other as equals and to walk in love together. Keep us going back again and again in our faith to trust in that gift of grace that comes through the death and resurrection of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. As we rest in the value that you bestow upon us as your chosen people, Teach us then, as we focus on you, to see our fellow disciples, to see one another through the eyes of Christ, to treat our fellow disciples as equals, and to resist the temptation to compare, and therefore to compete. Move us away from devaluing others, or from devaluing ourselves, but always again to live in that equality that you bestow upon us by grace, because it's only in that position that we can continue to truly walk in love together doing your work. Lord, in your mercy. There continues to be so many disasters. The fires continue to rage out west. There's also fires uh, out in Russia. There's hurricanes that continue in our country to bring flooding and destruction. The pandemic continues on. There's humanitarian crises for migrants and and other humanitarian crises um, for people like the Uyghurs who are going through re-education camps in China and other places that we're not even aware of where disasters and problems continue to arise. Bring your peace, bring your justice, and bring your grace that people would continue to move towards your kingdom, that your church would act according to your reign in the world to manifest your truth and your hope, even in these very difficult and challenging times. Lord, in your mercy. Trusting in your promises, we are bold to pray as you've taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I pray that this video again finds you well, wherever you are today. And I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you. I pray the Lord would make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Pray the Lord would look upon you with favor and give you his peace as his baptized children who are all equally recipients of his grace together. Continue to make wise choices about the places you go, the people you interact with, how you interact with them. Continue to be wise and loving as you continue to be the hands and feet and mouth of Christ in the world today in your various vocations. Continue to stay connected together as we are one body together in Christ. And until we get the opportunity to see each other again, I pray you have a blessed week.